Humor and PBS. Naomi Iwasaki is the program director of the Los Angeles Mayor's Office Great Streets program. Mayor Eric Gar Garcetti initiated Great Streets in recognition of the potential for streets to invigorate Los Angeles communities. Naomi, a native Angelino with experience designing bicycle lanes and developing outreach models for marginalized neighborhoods for the New York City Department of Transportation, is an urban planner hoping to affect positive change by improvements to LA streets. Um, each term. David Ulin is a book critic and former, former book editor of the Los Angeles Times. He teaches in the creative writing program at UC Riverside and in the professional writing program at USC. He was the 2015 Guggenheim Fellow. He's widely published, but the texts that specifically bring him here today are Writing in Los Angeles, a Literary Anthology, and Sidewalking, Coming to Terms with Los Angeles. A keen observer and eloquent writer, David lends a saunterous perspective on the strange coexistences of past and present, fiction and non, in LA's makeup. And last, Andy Wilcox, a licensed landscape architect, is a professor and administrator at Cal Poly Pomona. Andy is interested in the found conditions of wilderness that weave throughout the urban infrastructure of Los Angeles. His stalking carp essay, Contribution to Latitudes and Angelino's Atlas, shares a deep knowledge of a little known LA microcosm within the LA River. It offers the kind of viewpoint only developed by an insider's maneuverings and repeat retracings of a familiar locale. Together, this group represents the researchers, the depictors, the visionaries, the narrators, and the designers of LA culture and urbanism. We thank them for spending their afternoon with us and looking and are looking forward to hearing what they have to say about media and streetness. Um, we also thank Del Amo Construction and Epson for their donations this summer, and Woodbury School of Architecture for sharing their space with us. And also thank you all for attending. So with that, we give the floor to Joanna. Thank you, Andrea. Sorry, I'm just going to see if this mic will definitely reach David. It does. It's a strain, but it works. Well, we don't want to talk to the artists anyway. What we're really curious about is what everybody else thinks of your work. Um, so I thought I'd start out by asking our three other panelists, Naomi, Andy, and David, um, what were your first impressions when you saw this installation and what did it bring up, uh, bring to mind about Los Angeles? It, it, um, yeah, no, so the, uh, it was like watching my childhood uh, flash before my eyes in many, many ways. So I grew up in Southern California as well, um, out in La Habra. So we used to drive Whittier Boulevard. You know, I have a 16-year-old daughter who could care less about driving, uh, but moves around the city in many, many other ways. And so like growing up with car culture and, and being a part of the street, um, and having to submit to the cabin of your vehicle uh, at the center and being stuck and, and sort of watching it all happen. It was all there, but it also then bridged to many of my own sort of current interests, like the buffalo, um, you know, wandering on the side of the highway and, you know, the wolf and the, the sort of the real and imagined danger and possibility um, of what is and, and what was of, of Los Angeles, considering the street is the most sort of the largest and most ubiquitous piece of infrastructure that we could ever possibly have that carries, you know, both culture and ecology um, through and through in every single way. But uh, we see it very differently depending on, you know, the neighborhood we're in, which this film did in, in very episodic ways, I think, as well, moving through uh, many of the different pieces of, of, uh, of the city. And many of the stereotypes, I think, also, between, you know, the sort of golden calf portion of it and then the wasteland portion and then you know, just the, the grittiness of it, but then also the shininess of it. And, uh, you know, it sort of runs, uh, you know, puns intended, sort of right down the middle of, of all the major issues we have, uh, for better or for worse. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I, I agree. I have, a, 
I have a 16 year old, 17 year old daughter who drives, but I have a 21 year old son who doesn't and gets around the city in all sorts of ways too. And I think this idea of street is really, really important. I mean, for me, I was saying that when I first got here, I was literally standing on the yellow line in the middle and kind of toggling back and forth from side to side because I don't remember the last time I ever stood um, on a yellow line in the middle of a in the middle of a street, except as I was crossing it. So there's something really interesting about the the setup of the room where you're sort of in the middle, you're put in the middle of the street, and then agreed sort of the familiar and the unfamiliar images. Um, you know, the buffalo um, juxtaposed with um, you know the lawn blowers or the garbage trucks dumping the cans, and you know we all have had that experience of cans strewn all over the street. So what drew me to it was the unfamiliarity of the familiar, which I think has to do with the juxtapositions, it has to do in some way with the animation. Um, it, ta it takes something that we know or recognize, perhaps even recognize at the level where we don't think that it is, we don't even notice that we recognize it. We're noticing it without noticing it because it's so much in the daily life background and yet it foregrounds it here. And I think that that's a lot of what the street in Los Angeles does for me. So much of our experience in Los Angeles, or traditionally, is moving through the street at a, at a certain pace. I would say 35 miles an hour, but often it's more like eight miles an hour. Um, but moving through the street in a vehicle and kind of taking the street for granted uh, in whatever way, in whatever way that, whatever that means. But what, for me, this, this project or this installation does, it makes me pay attention to the street and particularly to the things that I often wouldn't, um, I would often would kind of notice at a subconscious level just because they're always there. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I actually first saw this installation on my phone um, in preparation for this panel. I didn't know if I was gonna get a chance to watch it before we talked about it. Um, and when I watched it, you know, on my little three by five inch screen, I was like, hmm, no, I don't know about this, this is LA. And then I came here and actually experienced it as it was intended to be experienced, you know, in the flesh. And I, I felt sort of similar to you, where this felt like my childhood. I'm a fourth generation Angelino, um, but have spent a lot of time outside of Los Angeles. And whenever people find out you're from LA, they have a lot of things to say about LA, even if they themselves have never been to LA and have only maybe seen LA on their phones. Um, and I, you know, kind of realized as I was standing here just a half an hour ago what an analogy that was to being in Los Angeles and feeling these, these sounds and these nuances and these sights that we maybe, you know, don't even realize we're absorbing, um, but really in composite make for a Los Angeles experience that you can't really truly understand no matter how judgmental you want to be about it, unless you're actually here um, and experiencing it, and you know the the sound of the helicopters, the sound of the the workers who are using leaf blowers. Um, I actually thought my favorite part was the the garage truck part. Um, my have a two year old two year old son, so he doesn't drive it either. Uh, but every every Thursday is trash day, and he freaks out because he can hear the trash trucks coming down the street, and runs to the window and yells, "Trash truck, trash truck!" Um, and you know we see we see the garbage trucks come and knock over everyone's everyone's trash cans after they've emptied them. Um, but that's just like a a little like you know five minutes out of the week experience that I take for granted and don't really think about, but um, I, I appreciate that this kind of brought that to me and, and sort of checked me as that's, that's an LA experience. Um, it's not all Kardashians or whatever, whatever the hell people think Los Angeles is about. Um, it's those little moments that I, I treasure uh, as a native. I love that idea that it takes a piece of media like this in order to re-familiarize us with the material reality of Los Angeles. <laughs> it seems that is to some degree what all three of you sort of riffed on. Um, so I wanted to ask David and, um, um, and Bill uh, whether these are the kinds of responses you expected. I mean, did you think people would start talking about reminiscing about their childhood when they saw this video or this installation? Um, <clears throat> no. Um, I'm not a native 
and I've been here 25 years and I'm, I feel I'm still a tourist in this place because nobody can give me a definition of this place. But it feels pretty good to hear what you have to say as natives because I guess I'm on the right track to understand this place. And uh, other cities seem to have a script that people have a common understanding as to where they come from and where they're going. And LA is anything goes. And that was the nice part of doing this piece is that whatever I came up with might not have been correct, but it was not going to be wrong. It's my impression of the place. And I think everybody has a different impression of this city. Whereas out of the major cities, there seems to be a common understanding of the place. And that's sort of what we represent here is what we see when we get up in the morning. And we hate it, but we, we love it at the same time. So the garbage truck, I don't have to prep, prepare the, the day before, get all ready. I hear it, I wake up, and I run out, and I put the, the trash cans out. And that's the beauty of this place, is that um, it just is. Are you a native? No. I'm not. I grew up in Sacramento, um, but I have lived in California pretty much most of my life. I just want to say one thing. I also have a 16-year-old daughter, <laughs> and she drives. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I agree with what David said. Um, a lot of this piece for us was um, trying to interpret the markers that we understand as Los Angeles. So those are, and they can just be everyday experiences like the trash trucks and the planes and the helicopters. And then there's other elements that are, I think, uh, I wouldn't say they're markers for Los Angeles, but there are reflections upon Los Angeles. So they're, they're sort of these very visceral experiences that we have every day. And then there's, there's some that are a little bit more thought through as well. I hadn't thought of the dimension of uh, the artists themselves being expats here in Los Angeles, which is one of the themes in David's book, um, Sidewalking. Uh, you said, um, you mentioned that LA is in its own slow process of becoming, which really resonated with me, another expat. And then it made me think, well, maybe it's expats who have that kind of version of Los Angeles, is that it was never a thing before for us. It's, it's a construction now, and it's always a result of all these mediated images that we've already consumed of Los Angeles. So I'm curious, David, how this video installation is sort of in dialogue with the issues that you were uh, exploring in your book. It's interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, um, one of the things I was trying to do in the book, which I think the video, is, the, video all, the installation also does, is to... I want to say render the city small in a certain sense, um, but what I mean by that is to take these things that we take for granted that are kind of below the radar screen. Again, we'll spend the next hour talking about trash trucks, um, but trash trucks are a great example. The kind of mundane daily reality of the city that doesn't record in the mythic story of the city. So what we mostly get in um, culture, in terms of cultural representations of Los Angeles, often from within Los Angeles, but entirely from outside of Los Angeles, is Los Angeles defined by its large-scale mythic tropes. We all know what those tropes are. We could recite them like a, you know, like a litany, um, right? Uh, Sunshine Noir, um, surfing culture, the beach, freeways, Hollywood, celebrity, glitz and glamour, all the, the kind of mythic structures that define Los Angeles in the public sense outside of the city. All those things are here, but the city is bigger than that, and part of what this makes the city bigger are trash trucks, and neighborhoods, and, um, and two-lane streets, and um, this question of, of texting, or you know, all of these sort of images, freeway traffic. So I think that's one of the things, and I, I wonder, I mean, I don't know that expats are the only ones who notice it. I think we all have to kind of negotiate our own relationship with, with place in a way that is different than when you're a native of a place. When you're a native of a place, you take the place for granted. When you're an expat, you have to kind of figure out your place within the city, and I think that that's definitely part of it. But for me, the identity of any city has to do with what 
um, DJ Waldy called the sacred ordinariness of the place, which means the, you know, you pull up at an intersection at three o'clock in the afternoon, and who's at the intersection next to you? Is it Snoop Dogg? Once in my life, it's been Snoop Dogg. Um, in his Laker color, uh, his Laker color scheme convertible. Um, I was like, whoa, okay. So one time I've had that experience. I've been living in this city for 25 years. Usually, depending on what time of day it is, it's someone going to work or coming home from work. It's um, a mom in a car with her kids. It's um, you know, a construction truck or a gardener's truck or a landscaper or you know, a, a dog, a portable dog washing thing, right? All these kind of normal things that don't fit into the larger picture of the city the way it's defined culturally, but in fact is the essence of the city. And I think that's what's really, in, in me, to me, the most resonant. Now I wanted to ask uh, Andy and Naomi, um, we always talk about, especially in my circles, I'm more of like a cultural critic, English background. So I'm always thinking of Los Angeles as a kind of literary device, how it appears in the media, what the ironies of those uh, representations are. But you guys are really involved in the actual material reality of Los Angeles as a landscape architect, as an urban planner. So I wondered, how do you guys kind of navigate uh, a city that has this bizarre fourth dimension, this media version of itself that doesn't exist, that for many people is much more real than, than the actual Los Angeles? How does that sort of affect your work and your perspective on LA? You know, it, uh, in a lot of ways, it's really freeing as a, as a landscape architect, I find, because it's, it, uh, <clears throat> it really is anything. I think, actually, in landscape architecture, we get a little too wrapped up in the past, in sort of the nostalgia of it all, and, and there's, there's sort of no going back. The only, uh, you know, there really only is the future. The landscape that we, um, that we see around us is one that's never existed before, uh, and one that um, we don't know what will look like. Uh, I mean, we hear a lot, like, I don't want to bring the river into this too much, but we see it in, in some of the images, and some of the wasteland images of the, of the piece today, these sort of awe-inspired, you know, things that are working at a scale beyond which you can kind of comprehend, other than the individual moments that make, make that thing up. And so, I mean, from my perspective on this, is that it's, it's fantastic because it can be anything. I mean, there are some limits to that, of course. You know, we do have a particular climate. We do have a particular limit, limit on, on the resources um, that are available to us. But the, the ways in which Los Angeles uh, operates or might operate should be a Los Angeles model, not, not that of any other place. Um, and I think we actually probably need to do more forward leaning in that way and less sort of, sort of uh, reclining on, on images of, of uh, or in, images is the wrong word, but the, sort of the, the types of other places, uh, you know, to explore the thing that might be. I mean, I, all your, most of our landscapes are developed on sort of what's easily found in your local home and garden center, um, none of which is necessarily from here. Uh, and then you plant them and then they're all occupied by as many species that aren't from here as are. And that's uh, very much the city of Los Angeles, uh, where you do get, you know, as many of us that are from here aren't from here, and you know, with a weird mix that um, is sort of wide open. Uh, I mean, there are challenges that, of course, we have with social issues and, and all the rest of that, and, but uh, just sort of sticking to the landscape part. Um, you know, the, the ecology of Los Angeles is that we've never seen before. Um, and I think that is, uh, we see it in our streets all around us. Whether you like the parrots or not, they're not going home. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that when you think about the, the media representation of Los Angeles or even pieces of Los Angeles versus how people re experience reality in Los Angeles, that there's sort of an educational opportunity there um, where you almost don't know what you don't know. Um, like, you know, in New York, you, you, don't, you know you don't know how to use the subway or you, you, know, you know you don't know how to walk properly, 
maybe. Um, <laughs> but in, I, I used to say about Los Angeles that it's probably the only major city in the world where like a, a murder can happen and a body will just lay there for days and no one will find out about it, which is a really dark way of talking about the city, I understand. Um, but the piece of your, your art that made me think of that was actually the Bisons by the, the freeway um, landscaping and how you know we're, we're all rushing to where we need to go. We, we need to go to work. Uh, we, need to, you know, we need to get our hustle on. Um, and we, so we can totally miss these parts of Los Angeles that are actually quite precious and beautiful. Um, like, you know, it could be, I could very much see that there would be wildlife, uh, a herd of wildlife by a, a freeway that nobody would know about for a really long time. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of think that's maybe why Los Angeles is so hard to define, is that they're all, are, are just much more of these scattered, uh, separated stories that happen and all together they really make up um, what this city is about and, and what the flavor of the city is and, and how it feels when we're in it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's that mix of a lot of transplants and a lot of natives, um, or a lot of natives that leave somewhere and then come back and feel like transplants again. Um, but that sort of part of the whole story is um, there. there's like this shiny veneer that we we put out there or that makes a lot of money and so it's what draws a lot of attention to Los Angeles but then there's so much so much hustle uh, that happens beneath that veneer that doesn't get you know maybe broadcast uh, outside of Los Angeles but everybody who, who lives and, and experiences life here kind of knows and, and is aware of um, all the time. I think the, the galloping wildlife through the installation is, is a crowd favorite from my experience. I've come here a couple times and watch people come in off the street. That's the part where they start interacting with one another and laughing. And it reminded me of this great graphic novel that came out recently. It's based on a comic, though, that I think was done in the 70s. It's called Here by Richard McGuire. Are you, are you guys, from, either of you familiar with this? It's this great um, concept, because what he does is he chooses one geographic location somewhere on the East Coast in New England. And on every page, he just overlaps in a sort of like a palimpsest, different moments in historical time in that exact location. And for the most part, it's an apartment in the 20th century, but it goes millennia into the past and millennia into the future and it shifts uh, between time. And I'll just hand it around to the audience after I ask my question, which is, is that partly what you were trying to accomplish here? Were you trying to create some sort of post-modernity that sort of explained the palimpsest that is LA, all these layers and historical moments that are overlapping? Was that, was that part of your, your project, to do something with temporality in that way? I, th I think so. <laughs> I understand the question. Um, as an artist, I, I essentially take history as a living part of what I'm working with. There, is, there isn't anything that's off limits. Um, so, for example, if there are bison, if there were bison here, even if there weren't bison here, but in this case I chose bison because I like seeing them in the La Brea Museum. When you go there, you see the ancient bison, and you see the ancient rhinos, and you see the ancient little mammoths. And that's free game for me. Like, I, I, I can use that. So, yes, I guess the answer to the question is that I'm not sure I think about it exactly the same way. Um, and that, that's true for pretty much anywhere we go when I'm working, is I imagine the place and I imagine if I know something about the place, that becomes part of it. It's that there is no separation for me in terms of the work. It's not as if, uh, uh, it's all part of the living history of a place when I see it and whatever I know I bring to it. And if I don't, I usually find out and I find out other information that allows me to layer that together. So it's it's all for grabs, basically. So yeah, the, the idea that the space becomes a bit more visible because you're exploring it through different moments in time and sort of overlapping them. It would seem sort of contradictory that that would happen, but I think that is the dynamic. David, what, what do you have to say about this? <laughs> Um, 
Space and time. Space and time. Uh, it, I come from uh, Central Europe, and every exactly. Switzerland, French-speaking Switzerland, and every everywhere you go, there's a history. There's a baron slay, killed a prince here, yeah, and whatnot. And you, as a kid, you travel around Europe, going from one castle to another, and from one museum to another, from one. You know them all. And here it's in real time. Um, and it's uh, really underwhelming when you come here because uh, there's no... I don't know anybody. The, the actors are semi-famous, but you don't know where they lived and what they did. But it's in real time and you start to appreciate the place for the people, the animals, the creatures, the plants that are here today. And I don't, so, don't really look back uh, like Bill was talking about the bison and the elephant. I mean, the elephant's a weird one. There was an American elephant that was native to the Americas, but I think my message was more, what if there was an elephant? I'm not sure anyone would know this. And that was my angle on it. And <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I move around the city and uh, I see it as the, the history in the making. It's evolution in real time, Los Angeles for me. It's, uh, it's happening, it's, it's an experiment and it goes wrong, awfully wrong and sometimes it's wonderful. And that's what I see. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that idea that you include the elephant because it's just something, just another thing you wouldn't, wouldn't notice in Los Angeles because so much is going on. Um, well, I think, in my mind, that brings me back to the theme of, of street, uh, which is so crucial to the LA Forum discussion series and obviously this double line through the uh, center of the gallery. And so I wanted to ask our panelists to sort of riff on that. How how does this uh, installation uh, help you think about streetness in Los Angeles? And I'll start with Naomi, since this is your business, right? You're doing great streets in Los Angeles. What, what in your work resonates with uh, the kinds of themes that were brought up in, in this presentation? Almost the same with Andy as well. Um, I mean, I think a lot of what we do um, with the Great Suits Initiative, um, and just maybe for the sake of everyone here, uh, we were we were a program that Mayor Eric Garcetti started when we first came into office, uh, and our mission is to reimagine and transform our streets as public spaces, um, and I add, not just as throughputs for cars. Um, and so I, I think, you know, what, what, I, what struck me with this installation uh, today was that a lot of time, you know, our, our streets are sort of egalitarian in a lot of ways, where we all use them in some some form or function um, every single day, multiple times a day, for the most part. Um, but a, a, in Los Angeles, a lot of times, there's it's it's not egalitarian because, you know, the way that our city is designed and the way that our resources are allocated, um, you know, favor people who can drive. And if you can't, uh, if you can't afford to drive, if you're not able to drive, or if you're just even not interested in driving, um, like everyone's daughters seem to be, um, it, it's it's harder, and it's and it's easier now than it used to be. But um, but it is harder, and it's it's more inconvenient. Um, and even though you you know with a car you have to find parking and and sit in traffic a lot of times, um, sometimes the way that the city is, is made, it's, it's just the easiest way to get from A to B is to just jump in a car. Um, and so what I, I appreciated about the installation was it sort of captured those moments that you might miss when you're in a car uh, on the street. Um, I particularly, I think it, it struck me the most when uh, there, there's sort of like a fancy storefront facade on one side and then a less fancy storefront facade on the other and you see silhouettes of people um, and you're hearing the cash register ding. Um, and, it, and it's, you know, maybe sort of like the elephant, you can sort of see one part of the city if you're just driving in that direction and happen to be looking out of the window of your car and totally miss this other equally exciting or equally obnoxious uh, part of the city that's happening just 20 feet away or, or 50 feet away because our streets are ridiculously wide. Um, but that, you know, what we, what we try to do with Great Streets is to, to break that down and to make streets sort of convening places and public spaces 
um, where you know random interactions occur or when you see something that you would never heard of. Um, I sort of think of Yelp as being used differently in Los Angeles as, as maybe denser or the East Coast cities or you know cities that don't suffer from sort of empty sidewalks like we do, um, where a lot of times I think people will use Yelp in Los Angeles and you know to, to look at a specific place that they've heard of and maybe read the reviews on it, whereas I imagine in other cities it's more like you've walked by this restaurant a bunch of times and you maybe you want to hear about it. Um, and and I think that you know if, if we see our streets as this opportunity for people to come to and, and be face to face with each other and hear each other and smell each other, sometimes that's not pleasant or, or it's awkward, um, but that's sort of what makes a, a vibrant and thriving space. Um, and we have all of this potential for vibrant and thriving space that's just being driven on and, and a lot of people are missing out on it. Streetness. Um, that's a good one. I've been like, I kind of already said it earlier, but uh, the streets are I mean, one of the largest sort of contiguous pieces that we have. I mean, very much it's the way that it makes up Los Angeles. I mean, it is the fabric of Los Angeles. All the stuff in between is all individual and private and everything else. And so, you know, it's sort of tremendously large public landscape. And I mean landscape in the most inclusive sense, not in like turf and trees and plants and greenery necessarily, but this sort of larger, more interconnected and, and living organism um, that's growing and changing and, and, and sort of adapting in real time, as David mentioned earlier, is it's truly the opportunity uh, of our city. I mean, we're going to keep building things sort of piece by piece and we we'll keep building icons and shiny things on hills. Uh, that's not going to stop in this city. I mean, not from my perspective, but uh, the real evolution is going to happen on the street and at that sort of streetness level, um, you know, whether it's the, the influences in the arts and music uh, and even in transportation and mobility, it's sort of happening on the ground uh, in between. Uh, and that, for, for the majority, sort of, uh, for me anyway, is, is the street. Uh. For me, it's about serendipity and community, which I think are related. And I think that, you know, LA is a really interesting case because it's not that we didn't have a sense of these things. I think that Los Angeles pre-World War II had a very, had a sense of the street as public space. Street is public, I mean, street by its definition is public space. Um, but with the sort of construction of the freeways, with the development of what we can consider the kind of post-war ideal Southern California lifestyle, which is the single family home, um, you know, suburban sprawl, which is not only a function of Los Angeles, but of most uh, American cities post-World War II, but Los Angeles really was the kind of epicenter of it. Um, maybe the only city in which the suburbs existed within the city bounds as, as opposed to being outside of the city. We sort of lost sight of that and the kind of ideal Los Angeles sort of middle class existence became one in which the streets were a conduit rather than public space. We went from our single family home and our attached garage through freeways or streets that, what does Didion say, that one of the reasons um, Los Angeles causes unease in some people and exhilaration in others is because the streets are essentially all look the same. There are no markers to tell you what, what neighborhoods are. It's a slight exaggeration, but not entirely. Um, the idea is that we lost sight of, we drove to our offices, parked in our parking structures, we want to go out, we go to the mall, um, park in the, the parking structure there. We would never have to actually engage with the street. One of the great things about the last, certainly the last decade, maybe longer, but really the last decade in Los Angeles is that that has begun to explode, partly because of public transportation, which is a huge development, the, the sort of rebuilding of public, inf public transportation infrastructure, particularly rail in Los Angeles, is revolutionary. I mean, absolutely like game-changing in terms of our sense of how we operate in terms of the city and the streets as public space. Um, but this idea that the streets our public space is a return in a certain way to Los, the Los Angeles of 100 years ago. Not exactly, I mean, it's not a direct correlation, but there is something about that sense of, of community where 
people are together in different ways, and people are together in unexpected ways, and we have serendipitous encounters. And I think in a real way, we can't overstate the importance of the um, immigration rallies of 10 years ago in terms of reconfiguring the way we think about the city. At that time, I was working at the Los Angeles Times, and those rallies, so many of them were happening literally right outside the door of the Los Angeles Times building. And most, I shouldn't say most, many of the reporters and editors in the Times building were discovering that there were rallies going on literally outside the door of the paper via the internet or televised news. That, to me, is the most potent metaphor of disconnection in terms of how we think about the streets in terms of public and private space that I can imagine. But those rallies really transformed I think really began a transformation of the city's sensibility. And what we're talking about, or what we're, when I think when I think about street or talk about street, what I'm really thinking about is the essence of the identity of the city, our disconnected relationship with the street over the 40 or 50 years immediate post-World War II said something fundamental about the identity of this city in that time period. Our reintegration of the streets, our reimagining of the streets, our re um, engagement with the streets says something very important about what the city is now and what the city is becoming. So to me, the whole question of, of the street is essential in terms of how the city reimagines itself. Yeah, when I first uh, came in this gallery and decided, okay, I'm gonna look at the video installation from all sorts of different spots along the double yellow lines, I realized that my heart was racing a little bit when I was on the double yellow lines. I was like, this is not safe. This is not safe. This is menacing. The, those double yellow lines are there for a reason. You're not supposed to cross them. And a pedestrian is sure as hell not supposed to be standing on them. Not in LA. So I was wondering, you know, does this video installation basically just reconfirm all of these sorts of fears and anxieties that we have about car culture and the pedestrians don't really belong here and it's noisy and confusing? I can't think of a single scene in any of the films that felt like, oh, Street LA is so lovely. I want to visit that block. Um, so I'm curious, was it meant as a powerful critique? Well, uh, <laughs> so first, the double yellow lines, that wasn't our idea. That's the LA Forum. Ah, and I notice know. they have patina already. When, they, they, when, they, when Andrew painted them, they looked fake. Now they're real, because they all they like the very good. Nice. Nice. Um, I don't own a car. I'm, I gave up driving two years ago. I'm a bicyclist. And <laughs> yeah, that's how I see a lot of the streets. It's very aggressive. Uh, no, 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 I wouldn't say it's aggressive. They're, people are clueless. Uh, they don't see you. And that's the danger of LA. They're actually very nice people. They just doing something else. They're not driving, they're shopping, they're texting. So you're vulnerable, not because they despise you or they're going for you, they just don't see you. And the few times that they're aggressive is, I tell my wife, is I, I think they don't like me because I'm free. I can, <laughs> I, I'm not going to work, obviously, because I'm in my shorts. And I have time. <laughs> They don't have time. I'm happy. They're depressed. So there's every reason to hate me. So, um, and I see a lot of aggressivity towards cyclists because I think they embody this independence that they, they want. So a lot of the, the things I see are from not the middle of the street, but close to the curb, and that's what I see. But it, it's not a... It, no, there's nothing negative, actually, I don't think, Bill. We love it. Yeah. It is what it is. So it's not, uh, it's not a critique, really. It's, it's, we're enjoying it, and... Uh, humor is easy, it's always easier to make fun of something. So I, I think if we were going to do a second part to it, maybe we'd approach it from a perspective of love and try and find something else. But this was an obvious... These are the obvious things that I see when I wake up in the morning. And they may seem negative, but they make me happy. It's good.
So why did we call it close to the curb instead of medium? Well, I did have an accident last year. I actually hit the curb and cracked two ribs, so I didn't want to do that. Um, <laughs> I think there's too much of... Uh, I'm not a militant cyclist, so I, I, I wouldn't want to do that. So uh, I do think that LA is a car city. I don't particularly want it to be a bicycle city completely. I like this city as it is. It's I, not no, I know it's not going to happen. We spent some time in Holland and it's just as crazy. It's just, you replace the cars with bicyclists and it's just as dangerous, you know. But, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, I think the, the medium, I think somebody mentioned that, is that you can never see both sides of the street at the same time. So, and you're usually never in the medium, you're in one side or the other. And I noticed that when the people visit the gallery, they tend to fixate, and I don't know why, because they're left-handed or right-handed, they tend to only look at one wall. And I think people negotiate the streets that way too. They probably only see one side of the road, and maybe when they come back at night, if they take the same route, they'll see the other side, but it'll be in the evening, so they won't miss the morning show on the other side of the street. Um, and I think that's interesting to have the medium is that I see both sides because I made them, so I know. But it's interesting to watch people only focus on one side. And I think that's what happens on, in real life. So what was your perspective on street when you were making this? Are you also an avid bicyclist or you have a car? <laughs> yes, I have a car. I'm riding the bus now to, to work. Um, my take on the medium, similar to David's, the, the interesting idea behind the medium to me is, is that even though you might be able to create an artificial situation in an art piece where someone can stand in the middle of the street and recreate that experience, we knew pretty early on, because of the scale of the piece that you would, and David was discussing this, that you would never actually be able to see both walls at the same time. So you have to stand way back, and in fact, you have to stand outside of the piece to actually see both walls. To me, to, we, we knew that when we were making it. We realized, we said this to each other all the time, we said, no one's gonna be watching both walls, that's impossible. You have to be spinning around the whole time, and it's really, it's very disconcerting to do that. In fact, in the opening, I think Roberto was just saying, we had a line of people, I don't know if you were here, I don't know how many people it was, but there was this entire length of the room. So half the people were looking one way and half were looking the other way. It was, it was very uncomfortable for someone to switch back and forth. So there is an element of, the, of this being an artificial situation, but it also is part of the reality of I guess if you stood in the median, if there was a place in the median, you'd probably still be looking on one side. <laughs> so. It reminds me of a Bill Viola exhibition that I saw in downtown Los Angeles many years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago. We had installations all over town. There was a huge retrospective at LACMA too. I don't know how many people saw that. But at the one downtown somewhere, maybe in the back of the Grand Central Market, there was a huge video screen uh, hanging from the center of the space and then there were two different projections on each side. And what I loved is that the security guard just totally owned this experience in this video. Usually they could just care less, they can't wait till you leave. And he run over to the guy and say, look at the other side, look at the other side. Um, so it would be awesome if you had some really engaged security guards here to tell the people, take a look at the other side. Um, my experience when I first came in here is people were wandering in off the street and they were kind of giddily going back and forth and laughing and twittering and liked the fact that they couldn't quite take it all in at the same time. Um, so I wanted to ask the rest of the panelists whether you felt that this was a critique of Los Angeles uh, or whether this was something that, you know, would you show it to a friend visiting LA and hope that they'd fall in love with LA by seeing it or is it an inside joke? I mean. What sort of, uh, ultimately, does it end up saying about Los Angeles? Well, two things. I just thought it was something I was thinking about um, in the last conversation. For me, one of the keys to it is that it, 
approximates the, the room approximates the scale of a street in the sense that I mean it's a small street it's one lane each direction but you could you could fit a car you could fit two two lanes of traffic in here and so I think that scale is really important it's my street. right and, and and so for my sense of it too I I love things where I can kind of almost imagine that they're outside of the gallery space and in the world so standing in the middle of the street I can almost imagine that I'm actually in the street the W O line really helps. So that's that's one. Uh, the sidewalk is missing. Yeah, the sidewalk. The sidewalk is what you're seeing on the screen in some way, in some way, right? But my sense of it is that, I mean, Los Angeles is a strange city, and I think that in some way, all I, maybe not all, but from my point of view, all celebrations of Los Angeles carry a critique encoded in, within them, and so in some ways. That's what this, this seems to me to be a very loving portrait in a certain sense, but also not a kind of, but a clear-eyed loving portrait. And I have no sense of whether an outsider would get it or not, um, because there is so much that's inside, but I also don't know that that's really important, because I think that one of the, one of the questions that, Sort of Los Angeles culture raises is who are we making the culture for? Are we making the culture to explain Los Angeles to the outside, or are we making the culture to discuss or comment on or reflect Los Angeles um, to ourselves? And I definitely prefer the latter strategy because I don't. I think that the former strategy suggests that we have something to prove or something that we need to define or identify or some kind of justification that needs to be made, and. I don't think that's true. I think that's a reflection of an older vision of Los Angeles. So to me, one of the most powerful and effective things about this installation is that it speaks to the city as it is, and if you recognize it, you recognize it. If you don't, hopefully you get some of the humor or some of the sensibility, or maybe you go out and, and learn about the city as it is. But I think it's an inherently anti-defensive posture, which is really powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems really open. I, I don't see it, I mean, it's very clearly critical, but not in, in, the, in the sort of most negative sense, but in the sense that they're, you know, pointing out the, <clears throat> the sort of spectacular uh, oddity that, that many things are in this city and the things that occur along us. I mean, if you've ever driven down the 10, you might as well be, especially out towards Palm Springs, in the, in the midst of a herd of rhinos. You know, with the number of trucks, you know, going by you at eight to five miles an hour, you know, and, and things like that, and you know that people would look at it and be like, "Buffalo, what does that mean?" It's like, I don't understand. Well, there, we there's mountain lions in Griffith Park that walked right through people's yards, and now they're there in the Santa Monica Mountains, right? They went right past everybody. Nobody even noticed. We granted, you know, they're sneaky animals, but you know, there's all these things that are. are you know, happening in front of you. Yeah, maybe not wolves, but there's coyotes running down your street. Is it a dangerous thing at night? Yeah, but, you know, that's okay. It, it would generate, to me, it seems it would generate a lot of questions and a lot of uh, ideas. And if it, you know, people took it even at face value, it's just one more, you know, imaginative take, um, you know, based in the everyday observation of, of you know, where we are right now. Uh, you know, it would only trigger, uh, I would think, you know, some, some deeper thinking about what the city's made of, where it sort of came from, and maybe even where it's headed. Um, and I think that that is very street in a lot of ways. It's not behind the big hedges, it's not behind the big fences, it's not behind the big gates. It's, you know, right there in front of you, uh, where even the, the most ordinary is, is as important as the most, you know, spectacular. Uh, it felt very self-aware to me, um, and you know, I, I like what you say that Los Angeles is, is so complicated that even a celebration will have a little bit of critique wrapped into it because this is a weird, messy, sometimes kind of effed up city. Um, but it, it did feel very self-aware, and and I think if you're making a, a a comment or an expression about yourself and you're self-aware, it sort of takes an audience that's aware of you also, uh, and so you know I. To the question of whether, like somebody who, who's visiting LA or has never been to Los Angeles, would appreciate it, um, I think Los Angeles is a very hard place to visit if you've never been here, if you don't know anybody. 
Um, it's not sort of like San Francisco or Chicago or New York where there's like just, it, it's, it's very easy to see what you should be doing even if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Um, it sort of takes a little bit of, of knowing or like a, or you're having an access to a niche or, or a car. Um, and, but what I appreciated about this is, you know, there was, there was nothing about the Hollywood sign, there was nothing about um, the beach, um, which are, I think, you know, these two, like, iconic images that everybody that has never spent time here um, has thought about. And, you know, of course there was traffic, but I loved the drop of water causing the most amazing pileup we've ever seen. Because um, I think everybody has felt that way at one point or another, you know, months ago, whenever the last time we had any precipitation was. Um, but but it, it, it felt very self-aware, and I but I think that's Los Angeles. Is um, there are so much of these little like nuanced things that we experience here um, that have nothing to do with the Academy Awards. Um, and you know, I say this as we are sitting on Hollywood Boulevard and the, and the Walk of Fame and everything. Um, but you know, when I'm in this neighborhood and I see people who are clearly visiting, um, and clearly read you know, some manual that for some reason told them to come to Hollywood um, or are listening, you know, to what they think of Los Angeles and coming to Hollywood. I, I kind of enjoy when um, somebody who's clearly high asks them for, for a cigarette, you know, and it's like, wait, this isn't where Brangelina is. You know, I, I kind of, I kind of smirk, um, as obnoxious as that may be. Uh, I do, I do appreciate that, like, well, you don't know what you don't know, but I, I kind of know it, and now you know, um, and hopefully you can sort of take that, what you've learned about Los Angeles out into the rest of the world, that it's, it's, it's not at all what we see on television. Um, it's, it's what you see when you're like driving and walking and working in the city. Um, so it, yeah, I appreciate that it felt very self-aware. I don't know if it sort of takes a, a transplant's eye sometimes to, to see to see what people looking in the mirror may not always see. Um, but I, I definitely appreciated it. I, I felt like it fit. One thing I noticed was that, I think this is the case, that there's not one instance of human-to-human -human interaction at any moment in that video. There's, there's quite a few people. <laughs> but there's always technologies sort of uh, are used in order to communicate, and the communication does not seem to be really uh, effective. Um, so it did deepen the sense to me that it was a kind of critique. And when I heard the um, the DJ, the radio announcer, say that this is wasteland radio, I was like, oh, so it is the wasteland, right? This is this like an Eliot, T. S. Eliot critique? I mean, his critique of London was that it's arid, it's dry, there's no fertility. Well, actually, there's rainstorms that people hide from. But he's disgusted by the lack of fertility of modernity. And I just wonder if that was at all an aspect of, of your take here. I, 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 I don't know, I'll, I'll respond to that in, yes, I think so. Um, there was, early on, I don't know, we discussed about having some dialogue in this and that it somehow became difficult to execute. Um, but I also think the dialogue fell away because, one, we became interested, or I became interested in a couple things. One was these sort of Ed Ruscha, the sort of speaking Ed Ruscha pieces um, that have to do with language. So one of the things that I wanted to explore was to just look at some of the words that are used here, killer, like, we had a list of them, I don't know why we picked the ones we did, in front. Um, and rather than having a dialogue, it would just be an audio track, so then that's what you hear, you just hear voices saying those words. Um, there is also an element, I think, of Los Angeles on the street, of it, of, particularly with the kinds of social media networks we have now, and that one piece in Friend, where you do have the absurd situation of people just standing on the street texting each other, and there's actually no talking going on. Um, and in fact, when I take the bus, there's more talking going on on the bus than I think in anywhere else between people. Um, but. I have the impression that the street really is, there isn't a lot of, there aren't a lot of conversations happening. 
people are kind of into their own thing, they're doing their own, and that seems normal to me. I don't actually see anything that's unusual about that. I don't have a... Yeah, I mean, yeah, compared to other cities. I mean, I think that when you're on the street, there isn't an obligation to have a conversation with a stranger. I just think, um, yeah, they'll be talking amongst people, um, and we don't really have too much of that sort of people looking out. Um, so, I don't know, maybe I'm not answering that clearly enough, but I, I do think you're right in, in some respects that we kind of moved away from having actual dialogue um, in the piece. It, from a storytelling perspective, it adds a, a tricky element into how you, how you make something. Um, it means now that you're addressing the audience in a way from a character perspective rather than from a kind of um, an omnipotent perspective where it's just coming out of the audio. And I don't know, maybe we just avoided that. So I don't know, maybe you have something more insightful, David. I think that although most of the the two pieces, the two walls are mostly animation, they're more of a photographic uh, approach, which is we're reporting feelings that we have, but we're not orchestrating them. And I think dialogue, that Hollywood does it really well. And I think we were, does it make sense? We're taking photographs, but we're making them artificially, but they're more like photographs. We're witnessing them and we're looking at them. All we're doing as a photographer is the angle, the light, but the actor does whatever he or she does. I think there's a lot of dialogue in LA, but the, the production realities, I think, I would like to record thousands and thousands of interactions and then concoct a story like we did, but with a lot of dialogue. That would be really interesting. Um, I just think that this piece, within its limitations, we approached it more like just wires of LA, and instead of showing you photographs, we made illustrations. So I'll open it up to questions from the audience very soon. Any more comments or questions from you guys for David or Bill, or comments on this theme? I think, I think when people think of a city a lot of times, New York City pops into our head, even though that's also not um, a typical city in this country. Um, it's, it's an anomaly statistically in so many ways, but it, you know, it, it sort of gets the, the, the king crown of being what a city is defined as. Um, but you know, when you're in, there's a website, Overheard in New York, because people have really robust and dynamic and hilarious conversations walking around the, in the subway, in, in restaurants in New York City, um, and, I, and I, I wouldn't say that people don't have conversations in Los Angeles, but I do think that there is something about having a conversation in a public space that reflects being comfortable in a public space and sharing that public space with strangers. Um, I've heard some extremely offensive things being discussed on the New York City subway, but the two people having that conversation, DGAF, because they were really comfortable with inhabiting that space with their conversation, knowing that it was just for the two of them, but also subconsciously knowing that other people are, are going to be able to hear it, but hey, this is the subway, and we're all here. You could have an equally offensive conversation with your friend as well, and that would, you know, that would be affecting me the way that it affects you. But I, I don't think Los Angeles is there. Um, I, you know, I think public transportation looks like it hasn't in, a, 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 in the memory of a lot of people who are alive. Um, which is exciting. Um, I think that there, you know, is is, is a, a push for or for biking that's safe um, and accessible to a lot of people that didn't exist probably at any point in the city's history. Um, but there's still there's always going to be a slight lag of culture um, when you know we're sort of all of a sudden told that we have these you know these safe and accessible public spaces to inhabit. Um, but you know you you still have to sort of learn the etiquette. Or, or get used to stretching your elbows in these spaces, and I think conversation could be an indication of, of, of that, uh, that growing pain. All right. 
Any questions from the audience? They are required. <laughs> and I hope we'll be able to hear you. If I could ask you to come and take the mic, that would be great. But yeah, Lori. I want to thank you guys. And I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned Ed Rocher because I grew up in LA driving along Sunset to visit different relatives. And when I first saw the Ed Rocher fold out of all of the um, buildings along Sunset Boulevard, as a child, I was astounded that, they, that they were, I could actually look in a freeze frame of those individual buildings because it was just a blur in my memory as a child. And, and so it, when I was watching this piece, I thought, well, this is a really wonderful way that's an additional way to look at what we all see out of our car windows, because I drive them. So I thought it was um, a fascinating piece, and thank you. Yeah. Do you want to say a little bit more about Ed Rocher? Yeah. I don't know if I have any more. <laughs> I mean, there's, I, I guess all I could say is you, you know as probably as much as I do, there's a long tradition of photographing streets in Los Angeles. It's not just Ed Rocher, there's a lot of other artists um, who have done that both photographically but also through painting and um, other methods. So I feel like this is part of that tradition, is taking, taking kind of video installation um, into that experience but making it slightly more immersive, so making it unique to this medium. So it was, I, yeah, it was deliberate. I mean, I'm happy that we're part of that tradition. It's a real, I think it's, I, I agree with you, it's exciting to see those images. And it's always interesting to look at these panoramas of Pico and Wilshire and Sunset. And the one, of course, one I want to do is Ventura. I've been wanting to do that for probably 30 years. Robert Flick does it too, I think, really beautifully. And, um, and actually kind of blurs the line because his, his boulevard panoramas were shot with the digital video camera and then the the collage, such as it is, is made of, of screen grabs. But I was just driving Ventura, I don't know, two weeks ago, and I thought this somebody should do a Rouché flick treatment of, uh, of this boulevard. Other questions? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Um, I just want to speak up as much as I can. Oh, I'll try to project. Thank you. Um, it really interesting discussion, and David, you were talking about the immigration rallies as sort of provoking what is now a decade on, uh, sort of the understanding of the city or sort of maybe the reoccupation of the city. Um, and I was wondering, like, I can't help but like think about the street and some of the new ways that we're navigating it through uh, Uber or Waze or Pokemon. And like, can, can we sort of, if, if this is sort of a snapshot of the everyday now and it's sort of spectacular, like, can we project a little, like maybe speculate as to the future of the street? I generally don't speculate because the, the future is always weirder than I could have imagined. Like, I would have never imagined, for instance, that the current Republican nominee would be the current Republican nominee. And if I had suggested that even as a satire two years ago, it wouldn't have been believable. So I stay away from, um, from projection or conjecturing in, in, in a lot of ways. What I will say is that my hope for... And this comes back to something that you guys were talking about at the very beginning, I think, which is that other cities, particularly other American cities, appear to have, and I think it is kind of an appearance in a certain way, but a pervasive one, appear to have some kind of master narrative. Like when we think about New York, or we think about San Francisco, or we think about Chicago, you know, there's a, there's a metaphor, whether it's a cliche, like, you know, city of broad shoulders or whatever, we have a sense of what the master narrative of the, that city is. Los Angeles, to me, doesn't have a master narrative. That's one of the greatest things about it. It's a collage city. It's a city that sort of is defined, you know, its order is defined by its chaos. And, um, and I hope that as the city progresses, we embrace that more. And so what I would love to see is a city that both has a sense of itself as coherent, which I think is in some indefinable way happening. Like I think, at least in my experience, that there's 
I don't know what to call it. I want to call it an LA sensibility, but I can't define what that is. So let's call it pride of place. I think there is a kind of increasing pride of place about Los Angeles over the last five, ten years as the city has progressed in various ways. Um, I think people are identifying, even transplants are identifying more with the city that they are currently living in rather than the city that they once came from. I think that's really important. So that bigger vision is important. But within that, I think the neighborhoods, the communities, even the small little designations, you know, little two square block areas are really, really important. I think all of this gives us a sense of place. And what we're talking about, I think, or at least from my point of view, is connection to place. What, and it may have to do with my transplant status, what Los Angeles has lacked for me when I first moved here was that coherent sense of place. I think the city is really developing it. So my hope is that whatever happens in terms of the street, in terms of public transportation, in terms of various infrastructure developments, in terms of other community um, stuff, great streets, etc., that it continues to develop that sense of place. The last thing I'll say really quickly is that it's useful to think about the fact that as a contemporary city, let's say as an American city, by which I mean a city in the United States of America, Los Angeles is relatively young. Right? As recently as the you know, turn of the 20th century, there were, you know, it was a, a very small city. So if we think about it in those terms, kind of evolutionarily, um, it has, you know, it's, an ad, it's a city in its adolescence. So I'm really curious to see what happens when it grows out of its adolescence. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to speculate either. I work for an elected office, and so I don't want to sign up for anything that I, I can't pledge the cash. Um, but um, I, I do think it would be interesting um, to see sort of decisions that are being made now that will still be in place, you know, 30, 40 years in the future, um, and, and sort of what the cultural and values and priorities of that future will um, will look like based on, on these decisions. And I think I'm specifically thinking of um, Measure R was a, a referendum that was passed in 2008 in Los Angeles County that um, you know added a half cent sales tax to Los Angeles, um, but that goes all to transportation. And Measure I think M is what it's going to be called this November is an additional half cent. Um, and you know there's sort of there's there's sort of this this transportation revolution that's happening in Los Angeles right now where it's um, it's you know just standing this sort of post-World War II single family, um, single occupancy vehicle narrative on its head a little bit. Um, but you know, who knows what that will look like in 30 years. Uh, what we do know is that there will be some resources to sort of make that happen. And so for me, that's just sort of exciting because um, even though I, I will refrain from predicting anything, um, the things that will happen may be able to happen faster or easier. Um, or or bigger um, because of these decisions that are that are happening right now. Um, so so we'll see. I mean, we'll see what the millennials um, want to do. We'll see what our aging population starts to demand um, once they're sort of uh, unable to have the the freedom and luxuries of go, moving from place to place as as maybe they once were. Um, but but yeah. So I I guess we'll we'll all see, and and, and it'll be very exciting. I don't know, maybe I'll try. I, I've been, it's stuff you hear about it all the time. I mean, I just saw something published somewhere. It's like 30% of the land use uh, associated with cars and stuff is given over to parking or 50%. Uh, that was a stat that popped up, something like that. So if we do have driverless cars and parking is no longer a necessity, there's a, to all those demand. Like we have all the public space we could ever possibly want. I mean, in a lot of ways we already currently do. It's going to come down to the political will. Uh, for absolute sure, but also then, I mean, those, you know, I don't know, my kid's growing up in a pretty hybrid world that's a mix between technology and culture that is unprecedented, and so it's hard to really kind of get a grasp on, like, where her and, like, look at watch her and all her friends interact and where they go, what they do, what seems to matter, what doesn't seem to matter, um, you know, and when they sort of come of age and where they can make decisions or force decisions, it, it's tough to see that, but... I mean, there, I, I don't know, I think that um, it'll probably look, you know, as different as it looks from 100 years ago, it'll look that much more sort of different, but it comes down to the, the positions we ultimately take and, and the, you know, the kind of uh, willingness to submit to technology uh, in a lot of ways. 
that'll do that because if, uh, like I said, I mean, if some of that stuff does come to, come to bear, you know, it could be spectacularly different. Uh, from the landscape side, I mean, from the, the ecology and ecosystem, it's gonna look like nothing we've ever seen before. And I think that's like extraordinarily fascinating. David talked about it evolving in real time, and that is absolutely currently happening. And I spend a lot of time in the LA River. The LA River is an ecology of 70 years in the form that it is. And there's no going back because everything is still washing in there from every backyard, from everything somebody's throwing out of their house. And like that sense of the, the sort of the gutter in the street is something we just throw it all out there. Um, it washes away to somewhere else, it lands in there. I mean, in the same way, the street sort of captures all of that. Um, so, you know, I mean, depending on the changes we, you know, see and the, the policies we make, uh, there's a 50% increase in the public realm uh, and all the creative and capital that we have in this little creative capital is got everywhere it ever possibly needed to, to bloom, um, you know, full of full of plants and people from every possible region that we can't stop from moving. Uh, and that's what sort of makes it that fantastic. I have two questions. Um, one of them, a little bird told me that there's an interesting story behind the captions um, in the, the, the river scene. So I'm curious about that. And then the other one, I'm not entirely sure how to ask this, but I'm my mind is just kind of buzzing with the potential of the overlaps between all of your different worlds. And I'm curious about if you see possibilities um, by being in the same space that are being generated by these conversations or, or things that might start to come out of these groups working together in, in different ways. Because I, I think that what we see too often is everyone working in their own little track, like the designers, the commenters, the planners, the filmmakers, the cultural observation ob observers, like, can you imagine something that starts to happen out of this this overlap? Uh, the the rivers of Babylon. <laughs> so I cycle up the river, and, and I think I said that an hour ago. But uh, I came across a graffiti, uh, and it said Zion. It's like. <laughs> I mean, I don't know many graffiti artists who would graffiti Zion. Um, all I could think of was either a Jewish uh, graffiti artist or a Rastafarian. And, <clears throat> and then I, 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 I took a picture, I went home, and uh, we're doing this piece, and I go, Zion, Zion, ah, the rivers of Babylon by Bonnie M. And, and I saw uh, a metaphor for the immigrants. Uh, I don't know my Old Testament that well, but my, my understanding is the diaspora in Babylon, Jewish, were in this amazing, the, the city at the time, but they were longing to go back to Jerusalem. And I feel this, this place, the LA River, is not a very pretty place, but it is a place of refuge for a lot of people from East LA to come and get some rest and sort of see some nature and that's the best they have and I think the they may you may want to be careful in completely transforming it and destroying this little pocket that maybe to the West LA it's an awful place but the East LA is actually a place where they can actually be out of sight and do just play, basically, and and it, it's covered with barbed wires, it's this very oppressive place, and to go back to the immigrant, uh, being an immigrant is, you, there's this place in time where you're neither here or there, you've been away too long, so you can't go back, and you haven't been here long enough, so you don't yet belong, so I, I see it as that was the reason for the piece. Now, I decided to find a translation in Spanish, which is pretty easy. Uh, I speak French, so I could read Spanish. My wife speaks Spanish, so I could do a good translation. And then, obviously, we have a second wall, so I had to come up with another language. And I wasn't going to do the English one, because you're hearing it. And, uh, and then I found that the Koreans 
are absolutely obsessed with this song. And so I, yes. So there's like whole dance groups in Seoul dance to the Rivers of Babylon. And I found a translation, but I have no idea if it's correct. <laughs> Which is always the problem in translations. So this is the best I could find, and it's a Korean one. So it's basically two immigrant groups in this funny place. That's Babylon or Los Angeles. Mentioned you, you had a bunch of LAPD helicopters flying during that portion of as the song yes. was playing, and I thought that was an explicit reference because I had heard that Rastafarians call the police Babylon, right? That they're the oppressors, and so I thought that I thought that was on purpose. Uh, the second part of the question uh, about collaboration. So I just this this piece, one of the. Um, goals of the piece was to bring people off the street. We knew this was going to be in the summertime here, and I spent some time on Hollywood Boulevard, and I was really amazed to see how many tourists there were. I mean, you know, it's intense. It's a stream of people. And we thought, well, we need to make a piece that's accessible to folks walking down the street. That's the goal. If you look at the sign that I made that's sitting out there, it says, everyone welcome, free tour. And the goal is, yeah, there's an orange sign out in the front that says, Everyone welcome, free tour, free LA tour. And the idea was that when people are walking by and they're visiting the city for this piece, is they get to see a little piece of the city. They get to get a free tour. And I think Roberto was here last weekend. He sent an email out. So about 63 people came, which is a lot for, I think, a gallery like this. So people are coming in off the street. And I think it's important that art play a role, not just for for a select group of people who know about art, um, but for everyone. You know, that's the intention of this piece, and this is one of the reasons why LA Forum is a good sponsor for the piece, is because they understand that. Um, it's one of the goals and missions of the LA Forum. The, um, the second part of it is, is that, you know, art, as a, as a, as a collaborator, if there's anything, is, is, a, is a great way to engage, like, you know, um, it doesn't need to be in service of anything, really, it just it needs to kind of be itself and be able to um, engage people and, and allow them points of entry into worlds of realities that other forms of art can't do, that's, you know, visual arts. So, you know, I think we both really believe in that, that's the reason why we're doing these kinds of pieces. I appreciate you talking about how uh, this piece sort of draws people off the street. I think a lot of what we at the Great Streets Initiative um, talk about doing with activating streets and activating public space, um, because you know we, we're an elected body and we work with the city, we think of things that the city can do, like changing the, the striping on the street or you know patching up sidewalks, um, but we don't enough think about the important role that art and culture play in activating a space. Um, you know, it, it's, it brings sort of the most human aspect um, of a vibrant space, and so I definitely appreciate that. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, public art has this, has an opportunity to activate a space on, on, in a way that, you know, maybe having cool bars and restaurants doesn't do, um, because public art, like really public art where, you know, it's just accessible and free is, is open to everybody regardless um, of what people can or would like to pay. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it, it really has that power to bring a, a diverse, and I mean diverse in like every sense of the word diverse, people together um, for a very uh, personal amount of time, for a personal amount of investment. Um, and sort of creates these, these organic, serendipitous interactions that we're sort of hoping for when we think about activating public space. So, I mean, you know, I, I think now my party line is we're always looking for opportunities um, to partner, especially with artists or uh, with people that support artists um, and public art. Um, we've, we've had a couple of programs where we try to fund up and coming artists to do public activations um, on streets across the city, um, Hollywood is actually one of the great streets, uh, it's the great street for the 13th district, um, so it is exciting to see this space on a great street um, that's sort of doing these things that the great street ethos really would like to, to see. Um, 
So I guess we should just chat afterwards. More questions? No Pokemon Go questions? Oh, yeah, here. Not a question, I just want to share. Because um, I did spend all of Sunday last week in the gallery. And the, the parade of different people and extraordinary people coming in on the street was fascinating and it was the most fun I've had in a very long time. There was an, an African American family of five from Chicago that were standing on this end of the gallery watching the piece. Then a Mexican American family came in from East LA. There were eight of them standing at the other corner and the rivers of Babylon come on. And they start dancing, and they migrate towards each other, and they start dancing with each other, and they walk out of the gallery giggling. And I'm sitting at the front desk just thinking, this is one of the many reasons why LA is LA and why I love it. So it, it's come hang out and spend some time. It's, it's a, an amazing experience. Anyone else? some wine. <laughs> so if everyone, have you said your bit? Anything else you'd like to say? Okay, well, let's turn it over to drinking and, and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.